Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Joseph Campbell draws from Tolstoy's novel Anna Karina to compare tragedies to the hero myths he discusses in his book The Hero with a Thousand Faces, suggesting that the happy families, the hero myths, all fundamentally follow the same formula, whereas the unhappy families, the tragic stories, are far more unique in how they devote themselves to dismemberment of the spirit. There is validity in this claim. You may not be able to devise a 17-stage analysis of tragic story the same way Campbell does with the hero myth. However, at the core of all tragic stories lies the same message. They contain the deepest exploration of human suffering, and not just for the very sake of it or for a catharsis, but to discover and show why and how suffering multiplies itself, albeit expressed in their own unique way, just like the unhappy families. To understand what lies at the center of the tragic story, we must know its opposite, the hero myth. The hero myth is a story of change, the birth of consciousness. Several prominent books on the subject come to this conclusion. Now, it stands to reason that if the tragic story is the antithesis of the hero myth, then it's clear that the tragic hero's journey is the death of consciousness. I believe there's no greater book on this subject than The Great Mother by Eric Neumann. By analyzing ancient works of art and tradition, Neumann breaks down the archetype of the feminine into four characters. The good mother, the virgin, the terrible mother, and the witch. For this discussion, we need only to investigate the negative half of the feminine. The terrible mother is seen clearly in Kali, Hecate, and the Gorgon. These represent the devouring aspect of the feminine, that which contains and never lets go. The witch, on the other hand, lures the individual towards madness, seducing them away from consciousness, as opposed to coddling them to death. Neumann makes clear that these two characters of the feminine lead to the death of consciousness in the individual. To be ensnared and devoured by the terrible mother is to preside in the womb. Staying here destroys the ego and causes consciousness to wane, allowing the unconscious to prevail. This isn't to say that the unconscious is the absolute enemy of the individual. In some ways, the unconscious is far more sophisticated and developed than consciousness. However, the problem arises when the unconscious action continuously weakens consciousness. Our unconscious plays a powerful role at the end of every year, when we celebrate by dancing and drinking. This is healthy, for it revives the conscious, energizing us for the new year ahead of us. Well, at least once our hangovers subside. Here, the unconscious takes over, only to have the conscious re-emerge stronger than it was before. Compare this to the alcoholic, who turns to drink with any problem they face. Each time they drink to fix a problem, the more likely they will drink again in the future. Each time they spend less and less time thinking about how to actually fix their problems, until it gets to the point where they grab the bottle every day. They lose their consciousness and become slaves to this terrible mother who contains and protects them. Neumann names this phenomena the tendency of people to fall into their unconscious ouroboric incest. The Ouroboros is synonymous with the Great Mother, which I should note is different from the Good Mother. The Great Mother is how Noyan refers to the whole feminine archetype. The Ouroboros is also seen as the pre-ego epic. The unconscious, the great round, the will of life, the unknown, the snake that devours itself, the dragon, etc. The term incest is found often in Neumann's terminology, such as heroic incest. Here, the hero actively and willingly enters the Ouroboros, regardless of the fear of being swallowed whole. He enters and instigates the fight with the dragon, making him a true hero. By entering the Ouroboros, the origin of all things, the hero re-emerges as a greater and stronger person, but only if he resists being swallowed whole. The term incest is now clear. The hero engages with his origin and births a new being. In Ouroboric incest, the whole procedure is passive. Instead of the hero bravely jumping into the Ouroboros, he slowly sinks into it with his conscious dissolving like sugar and water, merging with the Ouroboros, his ego dissolves, only realizing when it's far too late. What separates these two figures? The hero who engages in heroic incest versus the hero who succumbs to Ouroboric incest. What causes one man to live the life of a hero and the other to live a tragic life? Most claim that the tragic story stems from one single phenomena, the fatal flaw. It's likely the most widely accepted fact of the tragic story. The tragic hero fails because they possess a single fatal flaw. While this thinking hints to the truth, it's extremely misleading and gravely misses the whole point of the tragic story. For those unfamiliar, this idea comes from Aristotle's book, Poetics. He claims that if you take a morally perfect individual and have them fail in the end, 
then the story would be so disgusting that it would be rejected. If the hero is morally reprehensible and they fail, then this would cause delight for the audience. And ultimately, would it be tragic? To counteract this problem, Aristotle claims that you want a hero with a single fatal flaw that is responsible for the downfall. The diagnosis of the problem is correct. You can't have a morally perfect or a morally reprehensible hero, but using a single fatal flaw is not the right approach. And from more elaborate translations I've read, it doesn't even seem that was Aristotle's intended idea. In the Penguin Classics edition of Poetics, the translator, Malcolm Heath, discusses this misunderstanding. The Greek word harmartia, gov is making a mistake or getting something wrong in the most general sense. So the word itself gives little help in interpreting Aristotle's precise meaning. We must be guided by the context. This at once excludes the interpretation of harmartia as a moral flaw. The second time Aristotle uses the word, he speaks of a serious harmartia. But a serious moral flaw would be precisely the wickedness Aristotle has ruled out. Harmartia then includes errors made in ignorance or through misjudgment, but it will also include moral errors of a kind which do not imply wickedness. Aristotle's attempt to prescribe the best kind of tragic plot is, therefore, not as narrowly prescriptive as it may seem at first sight. The fatal flaw is not only an incorrect interpretation of Aristotle's thoughts, it's also wrong in practice. The focus on a single fatal flaw reduces a true tragic hero to a one-dimensional stand-in, claiming there was nothing other than this flaw that brought his downfall. The man was too greedy, too harsh, too kind, too smart, etc. This turns the highest in human suffering into simplistic propaganda. Now, obviously, the tragic hero has flaws. However, it's not a single flaw that dooms him. Imagine using the same thought process on the hero myth. The hero succeeds because of one perfect virtue. This singular perfect virtue is the lone reason he's able to succeed. This would make for a terrible story. Not only would it be a product of propaganda similar to the fatal flaw story, but it would be incredibly boring. Imagine if in The Matrix, Neo was supremely confident in his abilities from the very beginning of the story. Not only this, but this trait was all he needed to accomplish all his goals during the story. He'd hardly break a sweat. The good heroic story is about change, not a singular virtue the hero possesses. Now obviously, the hero most likely possesses many virtues, but none of them are what's needed for his victory, for if they could fix his problems, there'd be no need to change at all. The hero changes through the power of his own consciousness, whereas the tragic hero refuses to change by being completely consumed by his unconscious. This is the true tragic story. Not a man who possesses a single fatal flaw, but a man who's unable to change and loses his personality in the process. The hero myth starts with an unconscious hero who obtains consciousness, and the tragic story starts with a conscious hero who is absorbed by the unconscious. A large part of the tragic hero going from conscious to unconscious is the existence of nested insecurities. These insecurities are what allow the great mother to get her hooks in and start enveloping the rest of the tragic hero. It's from these points that the Ouroboros attacks. These grow from negligence on the part of the hero, something deep in him that he never fully addresses. As Norman puts it, the true hero goes into the unconscious world and divides the opposites. The true hero goes into the flaws of the unknown, tears them apart, then speaks their form into the world. I am in a world of shit. Yes, but I am alive. And I am not afraid. The tragic hero doesn't do this. Instead, he neglects his insecurities, and almost always, they're completely unaware that they're doing this. Sometimes his negligence is obvious to the audience, like in Citizen Kane, and other times it's extremely subtle, such as in Barry Lyndon, where it's possible that Barry's drive to be on the top of the aristocratic ladder comes from the very beginning of the movie, when Barry is rejected by his first love. First, she wants to marry the military captain, who's a real man, instead of Barry, who's just a boy. Neumann makes a great comparison of the tragic hero and the true hero, by analyzing the stories of Gilgamesh and Hippolytus. In contrast to the figure of Hippolytus, a very negative hero, Gilgamesh, with his more powerfully developed masculinity, is a real hero. Supported by his friend Enigdu, he lives the hero's life completely detached from the Great Mother, whereas Hippolytus remains unconsciously bound to her, although he defies and denies her with his conscious mind. How is this separate from the fatal flaw? The key difference between these two concepts is that the fatal flaw puts the emphasis on the flaw itself, where here it seems that the real problem is refusal to confront the flaw, a refusal to acknowledge the dark half of one's nature, a refusal to change. Now, the tragic hero ultimately does change, but not through his own conscious effort. 
By clinging onto that which he refuses to sacrifice, everything else in his life is twisted and deformed. So by the end of the story, the hero may still possess the thing they were clinging onto. However, in the process, everything else in their life has changed for the worse because they weren't willing to change that one single aspect of their life. And typically, by the end of the story, the hero is so horrified that they cast aside what they were clinging onto anyway. However, it's too little too late. Almost always, the thing that has to change is extremely valuable and good for the hero in the first half of the story. It's only in the second half that the change is made mandatory. For if the sacrifice seems easy and doable, then there is no tragedy. The audience needs to sympathize and understand why the hero refuses to change, why what they wish to keep is so valuable to the hero. This refusal of change and sacrifice can be seen as fate enacted. As Jung said, what is not brought to consciousness comes to us as fate. This is the interplay in tragedy between the hero and fate. If a piano fell on the hero for no reason, it wouldn't be a worthwhile tragedy. The fate and the internal contradiction play against one another. This isn't to say that the hero deserves everything that's coming to him. In fact, if the audience believes that the hero is getting what he deserves, then it's not tragic. The unknown contradiction within the individual causes fate to manifest itself. However, this very manifestation strengthens the contradiction in the man sending him on a downward spiral that will soon become unrecoverable. And oftentimes, it is fate, something outside of the hero's control, that creates this internal contradiction in the first place. And it's up to the true hero to rise above it and become self-aware. The tragic story is about fate enacting itself. To show this cycle, authors typically will show the end of the hero at the very beginning of the story. This is a well-known attribute of tragic stories that I'm sure many of you already know of. Whether in Citizen Kane or Romeo and Juliet, it isn't always so obvious, however such as in Barry Lyndon, when we see Barry's father die during a duel. Or even with Chinatown, that film hints to the ending with its title, which could almost be thought of as the first scene of any movie. Depending on how much the beginning reveals the ending, greatly impacts how much conflict is required in the first half. If we know for a fact that the hero fails, then less conflict is required. For the lack of conflict and the overall happy hero in juxtaposition to the horrible fate we know awaits the hero is more powerful than knowing a terrible fate and then watching the hero suffer. The dramatic irony must be seized. If it's made vague, then the audience doesn't know, and there's no tension in watching happiness. Moving along the Ouroboric Snake, the first half of the film tends to be an ascent. This doesn't mean the first half has to be positive, but they're moving towards the midpoint, and the midpoint of the story is when the hero is the furthest they will possibly be from their tragic demise. The hero, like a ball on a string, can only move forward so far, and upon reaching the apex of the swing, are destined to suffer the inertia of gravity and be pulled back from once they came. And just like the ball, the hero not only returns to where they came, but regress beyond it. This can be seen in Death of a Salesman, when Willie is full of happiness and glee about the future. It almost seems like things will be okay. Here, this is followed by an immediate and extremely harsh downturn, with him being fired from his job. It doesn't always have to be this harsh. Sometimes the descent can be a bit slow to fully develop. During the subsequent downfall of the hero, it's very typical that the things that assist the hero in the ascent are the very things that cause the descent. Because as the world around them changes, their prior positive actions turn negative. A great example can be found in Barry Lyndon. Early in the film, we see Barry get into a fight with one of his comrades. He wins the fight and is celebrated. Later, near the end of the film, a very similar event happens, but it has the exact opposite effect. Barry gets into a fight with his son-in-law. But now, instead of celebration, there's only disdain for Barry. For he isn't a young soldier anymore. He's a wealthy aristocrat, and this behavior is unacceptable to his peers. Barry outputs the same action, but the entire world around him has completely changed. What was once a positive action has turned to an extremely negative action. The descent carries us to the most important part of any story, the ending. The tragic ending has three phases. Realization of the Ouroboros, final conscious action, and suffering. The hero discovering the Ouroboros is them discovering the cyclical snake they're being dragged into how they are being or were seduced by the Great Mother. Whether it's Othello discovering Iago tricked him, or an Oedipus when he learns that his horrible prophecy was enacted long ago. With their ego fading, the hero produces one final conscious action to either revolt against the Great Mother after the cycle is accomplished, or to stop the key from turning. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Either way, it's hopeless. This final conscious action is insignificant compared to the Great Mother's will. Or even worse, the supposed conscious action is what is required for the Orbrook cycle to complete. Many heroes are typically so terrified by the Great Mother that they self-castrate themselves to escape the Great Mother. 
However, this is exactly what the Great Mother wanted from them anyway. The hero may detest her consciously, but is still unconsciously controlled by her, which makes him the tragic hero. As Neumann puts it, here, the attitude of defiance, the refusal to love, leads, nevertheless, to the very thing the terrible mother wants, namely, the offering of the phallus, though the offering is made in a negative sense. In Chinatown, the final conscious action is when Jake discovers the whole truth from Evelyn at the end of Act 2. The final act becomes the final conscious action to get Evelyn and her sister daughter out of town. However, not only does he fail, but it's his very actions, like the Hydra, that produces more and more problems. In Oedipus, the final conscious action is him blinding himself, and Barry Lyndon, it's shooting at the ground, in Othello, it's him killing himself. Regardless of the quality of this final action, be it noble or hopeless, the following is suffering. Their consciousness is insignificant compared to the foreboding dragon that devours men. All that remains is suffering and death of the personality. While the tragic hero is a negative hero, he's a hero nonetheless. He comes face to face with the Orborg dragon. While it's too little too late, at least he is aware. The same cannot be said for a very similar archetype, the tragic villain, when good turns evil. There's one major distinction between the tragic hero and the tragic villain. The villain never becomes aware of the cycle. At the very end, when the heroic Oedipus would discover the truth, the tragic villain does not. Imagine if Othello never knew that Iago set him up, or that Desdemona was innocent. Othello would become the tragic villain. This single lack of recognition changes how the story plays out significantly and the timing of certain events. There's actually a very specific sequence of events that takes place in the tragic villain story, similar to the hero's journey. Instead of telling you, I believe it would be more beneficial to show you, so I've prepared a montage of all the stages. Enjoy. Hostile? I show you hostile! Carbon fiber, 28 caliber, main China. If you want to kill a public servant, Mr. Maroney, I recommend you buy American. I've got an appointment with Mr. Allman. My name's Jack Torrance. His office is the first door on the left. Thank you. Luca Brazzi held a gun to his head, and my father assured him that either his brains or his signature would be on the contract. I heard they have a different name for me down at MCU. I would love that name. I don't suppose they uh, told you anything in Denver about the tragedy we had up here during the winter of 1970? This is our Colorado lounge. I want to talk to this movie, big shot, and settle his business for John. Who's stupid enough to steal from us? This is the staff wing of the hotel. Also, one of your top stars has just moved from uh, marijuana to heroin. The problem is our money being trapped by the cops. This is our famous hedge maze. Why don't you say you work for Colleoni, Tom? I thought you were just some cheap two-bit hustler Johnny was running in trying to bluff me. I don't like to use his name unless it's really necessary. Rest assured, your money is safe. I thought my jokes were bad. It's very, uh, homey. You know my father, men are coming here to kill him. You understand? Now help me, please. Do you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? I just did what I do best. I took your little plan and I turned it on itself. Look what I did to this city with a few drums of gas and a couple of bullets. Hmm? Uh, uh. 
Are you going to kill me? I would certainly like to. I know you would. I can feel your anger. You did good. Introduce a little anarchy. Upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. I'm going to turn you over to the Jedi Council. Of course, you should. But you're not sure of their intentions, are you? Well, I dreamed that I, that I killed you with Danny. But I didn't just kill you. Cut you up in little pieces. Oh, my God. I need him. Please, don't, don't. <laughs> yes, it is, Mr. Torrance. What will it be? I pledge myself to your teachings. My wife tried to prevent me from doing my duty. I corrected her. <laughs> I must know the truth, Master. You didn't think I'd risk losing the battle for Gotham's soul in a fist fight with you. No. You need an ace in the hole. Mine's Harvey. What did you do? I took Gotham's white knight and I brought him down to our level. I don't believe you. I can't. Michele, aspetta me lì, che vengo da sola fino da te. No! No, I belong! You're with him! You brought him here to kill me! No! Let her go, Anakin! But you're not like him, Michael. I thought you weren't going to become a man like your father. Damn it, will you stop pointing that gun at my family? No! We have a winner. 
I never wanted this for you.